Good morning, guys. Thank you so much for having me back on your channel. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends and comment down below. Um, today, guys, I'm doing part two of my healing series, and I'm really excited to be back. I have so much to go through today. But before we start, I just wanted to recap on some of the things that I touched on last week. So we looked at what faith is and the biblical definition. So we looked at Hebrews 11.1, 1, and it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We also looked at how you build up your faith and what that looks like. And we looked at Romans 10.17, and that says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word. And that's exactly what we've been doing all of last week and what we're going to do this week. You're hearing the word. They're not just stories that I'm telling you. They are examples of faith on how to receive healing and how to go out and minister healing. And then last we looked at Proverbs 4.20 that said that these words in the Bible are life unto those who find them and health unto their flesh. And um, that is just the foundation of everything that I'm teaching on last week and this week. Um, I also wanted to remind you guys that it is absolutely God's will for every single one of you guys to be healed. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, God wants you to be healed. And um, when I was preparing for this week's teaching, um, I really felt God put it strongly on me that a lot of you guys are watching and you're thinking, um, this healing is probably for cancer or it's for people who are blind or the deaf who can't hear. But God wanted me to say to you, this healing uh, teaching is also for those who are suffering with anxiety, who are suffering with depression. There's, it's almost as if the world has normalized these things. And God wants you to know that you can be free, that you can have a sound mind, that he's made you perfect, and that he wants you to know that it's, it's not normal. You don't have to fear. You don't have to worry. That he will give you the peace that you need just take a hold of these scriptures, take a hold of this teaching. Um, and if we look at 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And you too can have a sound mind. Um, and I just wanted to pray before we start. So Father God, I thank you for an opportunity um, to teach today. I thank you, Father God, that people will have ears to hear, that they will have hearts to receive. Father God, I thank you that as I preach and teach today, Father God, that your healing anointing will just flow through whoever's watching this, Father God, and they'll be able to receive their healing today. We thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, right, so guys, I wanted to look at Hebrews 11.6 today before we start. And Hebrews 11.6 says, but without faith, it's absolutely impossible to please God. Faith is so important to have. And I know I keep on emphasizing it, but it's really to build you up and for you to get a true understanding how important faith is. Um, you know, I think as I describe these um, teachings, I want you to understand that I know we are human beings. I know that we um, have, you know, these five senses that we have our eyesight, we, we touch, we feel, we see. But God wants us to be spirit-led. He doesn't want us to be sense-led. Um, and you see it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. It's so important not to be moved by the feelings around you, but just to trust and have that faith. Um, something I didn't get to touch on last week, and I just wanted to really revisit it before I start to look at some of the other examples this week, was that if we go back to Jairus's daughter, um, when Jesus came to Jairus's house, and this is really important, that Jesus asked all the unbelievers, the naysayers, the people that were laughing and scorning and saying, why are you here? She's dead. There's no point. He asked them to get out of the room before he could perform any miracle and for the daughter to receive healing. And so if Jesus had to remove the unbelief, what more do you have to remove the unbelief in your situation if you're, if you're trying to receive healing? I think we have so many well-meaning people that I call, you know, the Debbie Downers or the, the realist who, you know, 
can't truly grasp what faith is or these promises that's in his word. And just because they don't understand does not necessarily mean that they should have an impact on whether or not you receive healing. So you need to guard yourself. You need to either one-on-one trust and have faith with God. Or secondly, you need to be surrounded by one or two um, people who are really faith grounded and have that foundation that you can trust and hold on to God's word with. Um, So we see also in uh, Matthew 13 and 58 and Mark 6, 5, that when Jesus went to Nazareth, it says that he could do no mighty works because of their unbelief. So I really want you to get a hold of that. Wherever there's unbelief, mighty works and healing cannot take place. Um, So if that was the case for Jesus, that's going to be the case for us. And um, so just get a hold of that and just reflect on your situation. Right. Today, um, we're going to start off looking at the centurion servant. And this is captured in two books, Matthew 8, 5 to 13, and Luke 7, 1 to 10. And I'm going to read from Luke today. Um, So if you bear with me, I'm reading from the King, King James Version. And it says... Now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum and a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man sent under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the home, found the servant whole that had been sick. Um, that's so amazing, the story. I really, really love it. And I just wanted to look at it in a little bit more depth. So first of all, we have a Roman captain who has authority over Jewish servants. So, you know, back during those times, um, he had opportunity to treat the Jewish servants however he wished. But we see that he was a respecter of God's people. We see that he had compassion. It says that he cared for this servant. Um, We see that he also built a synagogue for the Jewish servants. I don't know how many Roman captains were out there doing that, but this was a man who had a heart and compassion. Um, And then if we look at verse three in Luke seven, it says, and when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, And this is really important, key, when he heard. We see in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. And you're gonna constantly see this or hear this when I read it, that someone heard, this Roman captain heard of the miracle, signs and wonders that Jesus was doing. And he knew and had faith that if he could just get a hold of Jesus, and if he would say those words, then his servant would be healed. And we see that um, he was a man of authority that knew authority and he also knew delegation. You know, he's a he's a captain. He's he's used to ordering individuals around. It said, I tell someone to go and he goes. Um, And so this story is truly about faith, but authority and um, the power of delegation, because Jesus has delegated his authority to, to us. And so if we look a little bit further, It says in verse seven, um, but say in a word and my servant shall be healed. 
And so the centurion servant didn't even feel that he was worthy enough. He sent out the Jewish elders to go to Jesus and said, if you just say in a word, my servant shall be healed. And that speaks for itself. That's so powerful. One, we see faith words being spoken out. Just say it and he'll be healed. He's not asking him to come to his house. He's not begging or pleading with Jesus. He understands the power and the authority of delegation. He's also a respecter. He, does, he knows. I'm not a Jew. I didn't sit under this covenant, but I have faith and I believe. And what happens next? Um, in, in verse 9, Jesus says, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. In Matthew 8, 13, it says, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto you. And this is so hard hitting, guys. This is amazing because if a Roman captain who isn't a Jew believes so much and shows so, so much faith, what more can we as Christians who are Holy Spirit filled, tongue speaking, believe and have faith? We need to start to apply that sort of faith into our lives, especially if you're trusting and, and, and hoping um, to receive healing. This is the sort of faith that we need. And that's why it's so important to get um, these stories um, and, uh, and a true understanding of what they're saying and, and the examples and what they mean. This is an example of faith and it's showing that anyone can have faith. Anyone can build it up. He heard, he spoke out faith words and his servant received. So I want you to be able to hear these stories. I want you to start to speak these words out and then start to receive um, because anything is possible. Um, I also want to look at um, the leper. So the leper is captured in three books, Matthew 8, 1 to 4, Mark 1, 40 to 44, and Luke 5, 12 to 14. Um, I'm going to read from Luke because I'm already in Luke and Luke was a doctor um, so I feel like sometimes he gives us a little bit more information with regards to some of um, the stories that he captures. So I'm going to read from verse 12 and it says, And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, Thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priests and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Um, the reason why I love this story so much is this is so important for us to truly get understanding. I have said last week and I've said this week, it is absolutely God's will for you to be healed. Um, and this is one of the stories that really explicitly details God's will. Um, but firstly, I want to say, guys, I come from a Caribbean background and I am used to hearing people say, if it's God's will, you know, I'll be healed. Um, or if life's spare, I'll see you tomorrow. And I want you to understand that those words are not scriptural words. Those are not faith words. They're not life. They're not anywhere in the Bible. But we say them all the time as if this is what God has said, and that's not true. And I really just wanted to eradicate all these sort of cultural sayings or these sort of things that you just do because you've heard someone say before, and really understand the impact of what that has when you speak those words out. Um, so let's look into this into a little bit more detail. Verse 12 says, the man was full of leprosy. Um, so picture that, someone who is full of leprosy, not partially, but that disease massively impacted someone's appearance, their body. I can imagine parts of you know, his hand was missing. You know, back in those days, they had to shout out, unclean, unclean. So people knew that they had the disease and stayed away from them. It was extremely contagious. Um, and then it goes on to say in verse 13, 
Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And there are two really important things that I want to pull out from that is that Jesus first, he touched this man full of leprosy. And we know from other examples that Jesus did not have to touch him. Um, we know that all he had to do is speak the word and that man could be healed. But I think Jesus did that purposefully. He wanted to show his compassion, his love, his care for individuals who are sick, individuals who feel rejected by society and just feel like they've been um, just scarred by the sickness and disease. But Jesus wanted to show, I don't fear sickness and disease. I have complete authority, regardless if the world says that this is contagious. I love you. I care for you. And so he put out his hand and he touched him. And what does he say? He says, I will be thou clean. He didn't say, it might be my will. I'm not sure. He says, I will. And that is the only explicit example where Jesus specifically says, I will. There's no examples where he says, it's not my will, or anyone who comes to him does not receive healing. Every single time someone comes to Jesus, he always healed him. And I want you to know today that it's absolutely God's will to heal you. Um, I want you to remember today to stop praying the way that you've been taught culturally. I want you to remember that God has a will for you and it's for you to be whole and it's for you to be healed. I think sometimes we start to add all these sort of like worldly sayings into our prayers, you know, or, or we just say it, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Everything happens for a reason. That's not scriptural at all. Um, everything does not happen for a reason. God wants you whole and he's not the ruler or owner of sickness. He's come to make you whole and to set you free. Um, how many people have been to the doctors and not necessarily received healing? But that doesn't stop you from going to the doctors. And that's the same with God. How many people have come to God but not necessarily received their healing? That should not stop you from wanting to receive yours. That should not stop you from claiming and getting what God has ordained for you. And so I just really want to encourage you as you hear these stories to be empowered to just truly build up your faith, to know that you can change your situation through the promises that God's given you, through building up your faith and declaring the words that God has said over your life. Um, we can now look, this is, um, I saw, all of them are my favorite actually, but actually I really like the story about the noble man's son. And this is only captured once in the book of John, um, John 4, verse 46 to 54. And this is the second miracle um, or slash healing that's recorded in the Bible. And I'm going to read it out right now. Let me just get to my place. And it says, so Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The noble man saith unto him, Sir, come down here, or my child dies. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son lives and himself believed and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he came out of Judea into Galilee. Um, let's break this down, okay? We've got a nobleman who is essentially, he's a royal official. He's a very wealthy man. He's probably used to um, having people do things for him, um, being served, getting things his own way. Um, but you find himself in a situation where 
he is having to go out and to seek Jesus because he requires healing for his son. And it says in verse 47, when he heard, and I'm always going to pinpoint these references because it shows that he heard there's a man out there doing signs, miracles and wonders. There's a man who's healing, who's saving the sick. And that's what led him to go and seek Jesus for his son who was on his deathbed. Um, we note, as I said already, that he's a royal official. So you'll, you'll see where there's humility, it's also linked with healing. He didn't think, you know, does Jesus know who I am? Does he know how much money I have? Shouldn't he come to my house? He went out and he sought after him for the sake of his son. And we see in verse um, 48, Jesus says unto him, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Remember I said to you last week that believing then allows you to see the results. You have to believe. And we can see here that um, a faith adjustment needed to be made by the nobleman. He wasn't yet there to be able to receive the healing from Jesus. And so that's why Jesus says, except if you see the signs, you're not going to believe. And what happens? The nobleman begins to plead with him. He's saying, please, you know, if you don't come, my son's going to die. You can just imagine the desperation. He's, he has no hope. He's saying, if you don't come, I don't know what else I'm going to do. Um, and at that point, I was thinking, gosh, you know, Jesus, you went with other people. You went to Jairus' house. Could you not come with him? But God deals with everything, every healing situation, completely different. That's why it's so important that you listen to what God is saying. You can't classify every healing need in the same way. And so what happens next? In verse 50, he says, go thy way, thy son lives. Um, and at this point in time, the nobleman has a great responsibility. He has to decide do I believe and have faith and take a hold of what Jesus has just said and believe that my son is whole or do I doubt? And straight away you see it says, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken to him. And because of that belief, we know that his son lives. But I wanted to think about this a little bit more, right? In those days, they didn't really have cars. So, um, and I researched this and found that the nobleman lived 15 miles away from where he went and saw Jesus. So he had a long way to go back home. And you can imagine 15 miles of just trusting and holding on and believing and having faith that what Jesus said, um, go thy way, thy son lives, and to hold on to it. How much doubt and fear and worry and concern could have come over him during that 15 miles? And I, I know as a human and, and just having emotions and just being in that situation, I could have um, felt or maybe thought, you know, what if? But he didn't allow. He believed and he took hold of it. And um, we see what happens next is um, in verse 52, he then inquired, he of them, the hour when he began to amend. He wanted to know, when did my son begin to get well? And that's important because it doesn't say when was he made whole instantly? When was he, when did he begin to mend, like progressively get better? And God is in the business of progressive healing and he's also in the business of instantaneous healing. And that's really important to remember. And what does he say here? It says, and they said unto him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And then he goes on to say, so the father knew it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto them, thy son lives and himself believed and his whole house. Healing can change families. Healing can change friendships. Healing can change any relationship and it can impact so many people. Because when you see or you know someone who's on their deathbed and you hear of a miracle that changes their life, um, and so God's work can touch the people directly and also people around them. But um, isn't that great? The noble man started off hearing a faith, getting to a position where he thought he had enough faith to go out and seek Jesus. Jesus then questioned, and you see it in all the examples of healing, what do you say is going to happen? 
um, where Jesus was saying to him, well, maybe there needs to be a little bit of a faith adjustment. You're not truly 100% there yet to believe and ready to receive it. And so then the um, nobleman begins to plead and beg. And Jesus says, go thy way, thy son lives. And he believes. And I think at that point, that's when the change, that's when the faith adjustment took place. And likewise, if you've been trusting, if you've been believing and you're a little bit there, you're halfway there, just keep on trusting and believing. Take that faith adjustment and shift it so that you can trust to receive the healing that God wants to give you. Um, in Mark 11, 24, it says, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. It's so important believing. And we saw the results of what happened when the noble man started to believe. And I really truly want you to understand that it's your belief. It's no one else's but your belief that will change your circumstances. Um, and so the last story I'm gonna to touch on is the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. And it's captured in two books, Matthew 15, 21 to verse 31, and Mark 7, verse 24 to 30. And I'm going to read from Matthew. And it says here, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Um, this is a really um, interesting story because um, people of Syria, where she was from, they had a very interesting lifestyle, um, very interesting um, things that took place, you know, um, and it was, uh, it was not godly at all. And so we see in verse 22, she's not a Jew. Uh, she, the, it says, the woman of Canaan cried, saying unto him, have mercy on me, O Lord, um, thou son of David. And you have to think, where did she hear this from? She obviously heard um, the Jews saying this. She probably thought, this is going to work for me. I just need to get his attention. I know that this man heals, but she didn't truly understand what she was saying. She also wasn't under the covenant of the Jews. And so what happens, she referenced to the son of David and any Jew that referenced to the son of David, that was referring to the Messiah, the anointed, the Christ. Um, the chosen one and she probably had no idea what she was saying but she was just saying it for the sake of saying it because she thought it might work and what happens in verse 23 it says Jesus ignored the woman so she began to cry after his disciples um, and I think this is really important God knows if what you're saying if you really truly mean it he knows if you're just saying it to say it and you know similar to what I said last week is that you know, a lot of us are trying to convince others around us. I believe, I have faith. Yes, I'm, I'm going to get my healing. But God knows our true hearts. He knows if we're just saying it as a tick box exercise. But do we truly believe? Um, and then can you imagine you're this woman, you are, um, you heard about this man of God who is saving and healing people. And you're crying out to him and he ignores you can you imagine the offense I, I can only imagine in this day and age people going up to a pastor for example because they didn't know at that time that he was the chosen one as such or the messiah but um can you imagine going up to a pastor and you're you're seeking um healing for your child and you're crying out and he just ignores you and i can imagine the offense that people would take 
I can imagine um, individuals saying, you know, I'm not going back to that church. I'm never, um, I'm never believing the things that they say, but she did not allow herself to be offended. She kept on and she kept on persisting because she knew that this man of God could provide healing to her daughter. And so what happens next? Jesus says in verse 26, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Um, what does that mean to me when I first read it? I was like, what? But what Jesus is saying here is that you're not a Jew. You don't sit under the covenant. Um, it's not appropriate for me to give you the promises that are unto the Jews um, and give it to you, the Gentiles. At that time, um, Jesus had not died on the cross. The covenant was only for the Jews. It wasn't open to um, the Gentiles now that we can freely take it. And she was using and saying things that she truly didn't understand and Jesus was putting her right. So, so far, she had two reasons to be offended. One, Jesus ignored her. Secondly, Jesus then says, this isn't for you. This covenant isn't for you. But did this woman stop at that? And I can imagine that many of us would have stopped a long time ago, but she kept on persisting. She then falls to her knees and she pleads and begs God. And what does she say? Um, she says in verse 27, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Um, and where did she get that from? I think because she showed so much faith and so much humility. Remember I said humility is linked with healing, that maybe the Holy Spirit just gave it to her and fed her those words to say, because who would have thought to say that at that time? And then Jesus says in verse 28, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And that's so important, guys, because I've mentioned so many times how we build our faith how we get to a position to be like all these individuals that had such strong faith that they didn't allow offense to get in the way. They didn't allow who they were in the world to get in their way. They all showed a level of humility in the examples that I provided. And we see where humility leads to healing. And that's so important to remember. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 7 to 8, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Um, I can explain to you how fortunate we are that God has given us this tool, this Bible of so many promises that all we have to do is really discipline ourselves to truly understand and rightly divide the word to build up our faith to receive. And I just wanted to summarize, um, faith is a powerful tool. It's such an important factor to be able to receive and minister healing. Um, I want you who have been listening today to truly get a hold of it, to truly understand what faith is. Faith does not quit. Faith believes and trusts God for healing. Faith is persistent, like we saw in so many of the examples today. Faith expects and speaks out faith words. Um, faith is acted, um, faith that's acted on causes healing and receiving. Faith doesn't fear. Faith calls it done even before you can see it. And that's truly important. Um, today, I want you guys to stand up and take that healing. Just receive it. Um, the explicit examples that I went through, majority of the examples that I went through are faith initiated healing. It was the individual's faith that led to the healing. And um, there are a handful of examples that I didn't get an opportunity to go through, which are spirit initiated healings. And that's where Jesus was led to go up to someone. It wasn't their faith that made them whole, but it was Jesus who went up to them. And that's the supernatural. And I feel that sometimes everyone's waiting for that supernatural, going, waiting for a pastor to call you out and saying, there's a woman here with cancer. God wants to heal, heal you. That is the supernatural. And that's not the thing that happens often. That's sometimes where God can use, um, use that to be able to show that he's true and alive to non-believers. But the majority is where an individual's faith 
led to healing and for them to receive it. So I really just wanted to detail that to you so you can truly understand that it's your faith, that one-to-one believing that really is going to change your situation. And lastly, before I leave today, I want you to declare, I want you to say this out with me. I want you to say, I have authority. I have power in the name of Jesus over all sickness, demons, and diseases. I have authority through Jesus Christ. Um, And I want to pray for you today. I want to pray. Father God, I just pray over every single individual who is hearing this teaching today. Father God, I pray that as I've taught that their faith has been built up. And right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that they will just take their healing, that they will receive it, Father God, that Father God, their bodies will be healed. Their backs will be laid straight, Father God. Cancer will be removed, Father God. Anxiety and depression will come out of their minds, Father God, that they will be set free today. And Father God, I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus that it is done. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to share just a small amount of teaching around healing. I pray that this will change your life forever. I pray that this will be shared and go out and reach the nations. And most importantly, I want you to take some action away, to keep on building up your faith, to meditate on God's word, to ensure that this book becomes life and health unto you always, regardless of your situation, regardless of who you are, regardless of where you're at. Jesus will change and can change um, your situation around. Healing belongs to you. So guys, thank you so much. Don't forget to like, to subscribe, to comment. We want to hear the stories, testimonies of healing and miracles that have taken place from you applying this to your life. I can say to you, to encourage you, that the last time I taught on this, I heard of healing um, individuals who were healed of cancer, individuals who were on their deathbed and their situation changed completely, individuals who were trusting for children for years and having no success applying this word and their situation changed. I've heard of um, babies that were born premature and the doctor said, we don't know if they're going to survive and then live and to be strong right now. So I want to tell you that God is alive, that healing still takes place. Apply it to your life. Um, Guys, thank you so much again. Have a great Sunday. Take care.